Hello, this is Father Hightower, and welcome to Vox SFX, the voice of St. Francis Xavier Parish in Missoula, Montana, and sponsored in part by the Foundation for the Diocese of Helena. We are so pleased that you have joined us. Your participation enriches our community. We hope that our show serves as a point of light, helping to deepen our understanding and experience of the Catholic faith and history. Join us as we seek through prayer, study, interviews, and discussion the roots of our ancient mysteries. Hello, and welcome to Vox SFX, the voice of St. Francis Xavier Parish in Missoula, Montana. We're so pleased that you could join us today. You may have noticed that the subject matter for today is the same as it was for last week, which is the spiritual exercises from everyday living. Well, last week we heard from Luke Larson, who is currently kind of the in-charge man of the program, we got to hear about his approach, his mindset, his perspective, and the fruits that he was able to gain from this incredibly intimate process. But I wanted to show to you that that is not the only way to view it, not the only way to experience it, because each of us is going to have our own experience, our own reaction to these readings, to these imagination uh, exercises that we that we do. Luke had a particular way of it. I had a particular way of it. Every person who's done it has a particular way of it. And Marianne, the delightful woman that you're about to hear speak on this episode, has her perspective. And so when I had recorded them separately, I thought that it would be a complete disservice to one or to the other to choose between them as to who was going to, to get some airtime here. And so it helps double up a little bit. You get to hear a couple of different perspectives, a couple of different approaches to this material, to this wonderful uh, series of exercises. And I get to make sure that two people I really like are both heard <laughs> and, and are able to get out there on the air because these exercises are very meaningful. They're profoundly life well, Marianne would criticize me for saying changing, life enhancing, let's say it that way. It really brings out stuff, uh, good things in us. And those good things are going to look a little bit different. Your fruits from these exercises will be different than my fruits, which were different than Luke's, which are different than Marianne's. And so in, in listening to this, I think it'll give a good perspective, a good look at how they're a little bit different at how you can kind of come at this subject from two different angles. And so I'm, I'm delighted to be able to share this with you. Marianne is one of, my, one of my very favorite people. When I was going through the exercises, she was a person that they had on as a guest speaker. And I just adored listening to her lectures and, and to her talks. She was always so well prepared, so composed. And she has the most delightful voice. And so when she agreed to come on the show to talk about this, I was just beside myself because I've got Luke, who is the guy who was in charge of it, who's leading us through this. Marianne, who's this wealth of information, this wealth of knowledge and history concerning this program. And so we really are given quite a treat here at St. Francis Xavier by having these two individuals and many more who are involved in this amazing process. So if by the end of this, you haven't been convinced to join, I'm not sure <laughs> what exactly will, because yeah, these, these two folks have a, have a beautiful approach and, and beautiful spiritualities as well. So last week we got to hear from Luke Larson and this week we're going to get to hear from Mary Ann. So please uh, buckle in and prepare yourself for a real treat as we speak to Mary Ann Bigelow about the spiritual exercises for everyday living. With me in the studio today is Marianne Bigelow, who is a icon here at St. Francis Xavier. Marianne, I appreciate you so much for coming on today. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. Now, it. we're here to talk about something that is extremely important to both of us, but that you've been involved with for far longer than I have, this uh, the SEAL program. Uh, 
It's a fairly special year for it, though, isn't it? Absolutely. This past May, we completed 30 years of offering the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius in the form of the SEAL retreat here at St. Francis. And I think that is just a very momentous uh, event for us. And we're not done yet. This is going to keep on going because of once you've experienced the exercises, many decide that they don't want to let it go. So they discern to become directors. And, you know, it, it, it varies as to um, how many years you may direct or where your life might uh, take you. We've had several directors that were formed here that actually took um, the program to different places. We have one that started a SEAL program in Billings. Um, there was another gal here that went through our program and got involved with the program, the SEAL program in the Tri-Cities area. So it it's an amazing event, both spiritually and and just where it takes us as people, how life-giving it can be to us if we just allow it. I couldn't agree more. And uh, I think you have a fairly special story about how you came to the exercises. I did. Well, first of all, um, the story behind the starting of the spiritual exercises here, I think, is amazing. There was a group of parishioners, about nine of them, that felt, we're a Jesuit parish. Why are we not experiencing the spiritual exercises? So they pursued that. Well, it wasn't an easy travel you know, and part of that's just because it is a time commitment, and the Jesuits that were here at the time, their time was very, you know, overworked. They were overworked. So, how could we accommodate that? Well, they persisted. And finally, in 1994, September of 1994, uh, Father Healy, and then, then Scholastic, who became a full-fledged priest Jesuit, Father Jerry Graham, took a group of nine parishioners through the process. And they were so diligent, and they were so... It, it, it was... I don't want to say it's life-changing, because I think what it is is it's life-opening. It's not so much that you do the retreat and you change. It's more like these wonderful spiritual doors and windows are open to go deeper. And so they completed the nine month. And, you know, another thing about the exercise is it's so personal. You can have 20 people in the parish doing the exercises. They're sort of on parallel paths, but their journey is going to be very unique to them. The Lord is going to be speaking to who they are as his creation intimately, personally, it just is that way. And um, so when they were done, about mid-May, the powers that be said, okay, if you want this to continue, you are going to have to make it happen. And they did. And so originally, this was a very lay ministry. We had uh, about, I think there were eight people who basically did a crash course in formation over that summer to take the next group through September of 95. That's not a whole lot of time. It's not a whole lot. They were so dedicated, and they were just passionate. I I think that's a great way to put it. Mm -hmm. They did not want this to die. They wanted to make sure that others could partake in this opportunity. Well, that was 30 years ago. You know, I just, that just is mind blowing to me to think that uh, we've, you know, and we've had directors that have come and gone uh, because of life happenings. Uh, they may have moved away. Their life may have changed in some way that they couldn't accommodate the um, things that were required of them to direct an, an individual through the exercises. We've also lost some. Some of our directors over time, over 30 years, we have passed away. But I tell you what, they're with us still. You know, they, they left indelible marks on this ministry. And so here we are. So in 1995, the exercises found me. And it, it was kind of amazing. My children attend. At that point, I was not a parishioner at, at St. Francis. My children were at the St. Joseph School, which is no longer on this campus. 
Um, but at that time it was. And so I would frequent daily mass at, at St. Francis, was getting to know people, was getting to know different events they were having. Well, somewhere along the line, the exercises poked me and said, maybe you need to do this. Part of that formation period in the summer of 95, they offered a three-day retreat, an Ignatian three-day, eight-day, and um, I was able, uh, my children were young, so I couldn't give up the whole eight days. So I did the three-day. It was over a weekend. It just lit the fire. And a lot of uh, the prayer opportunities that then were really offered in full in the full exercises were kind of hinted at. You got these ideas of different prayer, ways of praying that Ignatius invites us to. And so I did the three day and was like, I was sold. Okay, I'm starting. And then the rest is history. You sure. know, that, that um, fall uh, I started. And then when I completed, that would have been May of 96, I was invited to discern about being a director. And at that time, you know, even now, one of those is to make sure that we have directors. You know, Be, like I said, it's not like we come and go, but, uh, you know, we do lose people along the way. So we need to continually form new directors so that we can continue this ministry over time. So I started in the discernment process in the fall of 96 and started directing in 98. So here I am, you know, and I I have to say that my passion for Ignatian spirituality is, if not the same more, through the years and just seeing out how it unfolds in my life in different ways and different opportunities, and just the meeting of my God on such a personal level. I'm a cradle Catholic, so I grew up with a lot of stuff, a lot of traditions. But Ignatian spirituality really opened me up to realize that I am loved, that my God loves me, and it's not just a head thing. And Ignatian spirituality, the exercises helped me to really make it a heart thing. And that I choose now with that at the foundation. And I think it's really cool that that has remained there for you. Like I've spoken with people over the years whose, whose kind of faith has waxed and waned, whose intensity of prayer has waxed and waned, but it sounds to me like this has just been a continual source of, of fruit for you, an, an infinite vineyard, if you will. Absolutely. And for me... As, as a mom, it, it became a real family event. Um, my husband did the exercises. I think he did them in 0203. Um, but he would always say, we, we, we joke and we'll hear something. We'll go, oh, that's Ignatian, you know. And then my children, they were, they were pretty young. The oldest was um, nine. The youngest was four. And, um, you know, they knew when when I had my prayer time, that they needed to be quiet and busy themselves with something. On the weekend, I used to joke that, now dad's in charge during this time, but unless you're bleeding, you know, if you're bleeding, you can, you can disturb me. But <laughs> we used to always joke about that. But it, so it became, it wasn't just a, just personal, which it was incredibly personal. But for me, it was a family event. You know, the whole family, the, the spirituality overflowed if you will, for the whole family. Well, like you were saying, that, that hour a day uh, can be interesting based on people's work schedules or based on their, their home life. Uh, sometimes you have to be creative to be able to find that. Absolutely. I mean, I've directed people that um, their kids are busy after school with sports and they've got to get them to the practices and everything. And they the kids would go do their, their practicing or whatever and they would go off to the car and pray. You know, we always encourage people to, do, if they can, to kind of have a prayer space where they go. But that shouldn't be limiting. You know, it's wonderful when you can light your candle and go off in comfortable chair and read your scripture or your meditation. But some, like you said, sometimes you have to be creative. Sometimes you're in the car and, you know, you just have to use that the time that's available. I think we always talk, and Sister Margie Hogan, who has been our uh, supervisor since the very beginning, uh, us directors, she would always really talk 
about being faithful to the process and how important that is. Be faithful to the process. It may not always be what, you know, look like what you want it to look like, you know, being in that prayer space with your candle or whatever, your Bible, and it, it might have to be, you know, in your car or um, the year I did it, we went as a family to Disneyland. Mm. And so the kids were young enough that um, we'd, we'd go off early in the morning and then we'd kind of have naps in the afternoon. Mm-hmm. And while they were napping, I prayed. I'm not saying that to give myself a pat on the back. I'm saying it. You make it happen. Being faithful to the process. And, you know, I, I think most of us, when we first hear about an hour of prayer a day, roughly an hour of direction a week with your spiritual director, a meeting once a month for group sharing and other uh, opportunities to learn about the different movements, it can be uh, intimidating. Most people come and they have a, a prayer routine, and it's not that we want them to stop that, but they have to accommodate this new event, sure. you know, the, what we're, what's being asked of them. They're given prayer materials for each day. You know, that's why it's it's wonderful when you meet with your director because you get a week's worth of material. But it's also very, um, Ignatius would always say, use what works. So you might have a scripture, you might have five or six scriptures for the week and one really hits home. The Lord and Ignatius would say, if you need to spend more time on that, spend more time there. Because it's speaking to you, and the Lord would be saying, and I'm speaking to you. Sure. So uh, there's a lot of freedom in in how we proceed, but that faithfulness to the process, that faithfulness, and to and to know in a sense the movements. I love the 19th annotation, which is what seal is in the in the spiritual exercises. There's the 19th annotation, which is the nine month process. There's a 20th annotation, which is the 30-day retreat. There's also the 18th annotation, which is um, an abbreviated version of the 19th and 20th. Okay, Um, there are there are places that individuals may really be called to go, and others that they're not. So the 18th is a little bit abbreviated, if you will. But that 19th annotation, I think, is so beautiful because we do it over nine months and we develop habits. You develop habits in your prayer. And and that's a good thing. You know, sometimes we have not so great habits, but this is a good thing. This is a life-giving one. And when you're done with that nine months, you have this prayer habit, if you will, that you can you take with you, you know. And I... I a couple of the things that uh, I think were so awakening for me that are part of the Ignatian uh, experience, one is praying with your imagination. That was new territory for me. It just never came up. It wasn't like I was avoiding it or anything. It just never came up. And when I was given the opportunity to go into the scripture scene and um, and see what happened, you know, to be very present to the people, to the place. There's another aspect of that. They call it praying with your senses. What do you smell? What do you see? What do you hear? What a freeing experience and what a way to learn about Christ. What a way to experience our our God who became human for us. And just to get into that scene, my first experience was on that three-day retreat before I started the exercises in formal. And one of the scriptures that we were given to pray with was the Martha Mary scripture. And you know, for, for most of us women, I think we think we're Martha's, you know. So I thought, okay, I'm being given permission to get into this scene. I think I'm going to be Mary for a little bit. Oh my goodness, what a freeing experience to be able to sit there and not worry about the meal, not worry about is everything in the right place. But also, I felt real compassion for Martha. She's a, she was a very good person. She was doing very good things, and she wanted to do them for Jesus. And to have that, and so to kind of bring the two people together. You know, when is that attention to detail important? 
When can I let go of it? And I learned a big piece of that in that praying with my imagination. Oh, I could go on and on about that. It is so (laughs) beautiful. And to give ourselves permission to enter the scene. And sometimes it's not easy. A lot of times people, um, they feel like, well, it's not real. I'm making this up. Well, I'm, I never felt like I was making something up. I, was, I felt like I was given an opportunity really to get into that scene more deeply, to really get into the scene and what is Jesus doing? What are these other people doing in this scene? What are they looking at, you know? And, um, but I had one gal who, it, she struggled, but after every scripture reading, she would in turn write a poem prayer. And it was beautiful, and and you could just hear her her receiving the Lord by what she was able to. So it's a little aberration of the imagination, Mm -hmm. but it was very fruitful for her. Well, like you said, it's not about conjuring like the exact historical setting. It's about the emotional and spiritual connection with the scripture. Yes. And that was so important. You know, Ignatius was a pretty heady guy originally. And he, in the, you know, he was injured in battle, and during his recuperation, um, that's when he started to get in touch with his imagination, and how he was feeling. You know, he would read about the saints, and he'd have these wonderful feelings inside that lasted. He was, he loved the ladies, and he, he would. Um, you know, fantasize about the the woman he would fall in love with or whatever, and it was very fleeting. And he started to look at that and go, okay, why? What's the difference? And that's where discernment really comes in. That's a huge part of Ignatian spirituality. Um, A little sidestep, one of uh, Father Larry Gillick once upon a time said that discernment is a way of life. It's not just something we do on occasion. We do it to a certain extent, all day long, especially if we want to. He, he would say, people would come and talk to him and say, will you help me discern today? And he goes, it's not a one-day thing. It's, a, it's a every day, all days. And I, I think that's a beautiful way to look at it. You, that it, and, it's, and it helps us, you know. Something happens in our every day, and we go, whoa. And we have a feeling, and we can go, okay, what is that feeling trying to tell me? Mm-hmm. Or where is it taking me? Is it taking me to a, a vulnerable place? Um, and really using our imagination to open that up. And I, I mentioned that Ignatius was a very heady guy, but during this recuperation, during his real intense conversion, he was pulled to open his heart. And that's one of the things in the exercises that we talk a lot about is don't get stuck in your head. You know, we can read scripture and get very heady about it. But where's my heart going? Where's the Lord maybe calling me? And again, I don't think I can say it enough about the whole idea of going deeper. You know, I about 10 years ago, I was on a retreat and um, it was a momentous time. I was turning a particular age. And I thought, life is going to change now. And so I really took that to my prayer during this retreat. And I heard loud and clear, not different, Marianne, deeper. Mm. I wasn't being called to live my life differently. I was being called to go deeper into where the Lord had already led me. And I see that now all the time when we're doing the exercises, when we're praying. It's not that it's going to change us. Our Lord gave us these wonderful gifts at the very beginning when he created us, before he created us. And it's like it it takes a lifetime to really embrace them the way the Lord wants us to live them out. And I I look forward to hopefully getting as many years into this as as you have as well. But I want to double back real quick. Uh, You mentioned several times freedom. You used the word free, that it was freeing. Free from what? I think, oh, there's so many aspects of this, but free from the things that confine me. And, and a lot of those things um, we, we get very complacent about. You know, we, get, we, we learn to 
live life a certain way, we can become complacent. Um, you know, in the first week of the exercises, we talk about blocks to God's love or sin. And basically, it's what keeps me from receiving the love of my God. If we can embrace that, if we can look at that and even embrace our vulnerabilities to the point, it's very freeing. It's very freeing to, to not try to wall ourselves off from the things that we don't like or the things that may be hard, mm. um, but to embrace that. Brene Brown, and I'm, I'm not a scholar on her, but she has said that our vulnerabilities are what make us beautiful. Oh, I like that. I do too. And I, and, I, and I think that's what God is trying to tell us. Okay, you may have these, these things that, or maybe things have happened in your life that have been hurtful, and you, and you defend yourself against them. And in that defense, though, we block ourselves even from the love of God. So he's saying, okay, how can we embrace these places in a way that will be life-giving, in a way that will free you to let me love you? Well, and you had talked about, before we, we started recording here, that that love and that freedom for you is directly related to each of these individual movements, that it kind of changes and evolves as it goes through. Absolutely. If, if I might just walk through the exercises. Please. You know, I, me- I think I mentioned about preparation days. And the first six weeks is a time of preparation. And so you're not exactly into the depth of the exercises themselves, but it's a wonderful opportunity to get into the, the scheme of things. It's during this time that you, that you meet with your director and get, you, you each get to know each other. You each get to share um, where you're coming from and, and uh, just the, the, a, a place of comfort, mm. if you will. And then, you know, we're reminded to go back and remember where God has loved us. And sometimes they're they're not, um, we forget about them. And and so it's it's a wonderful opportunity to get back in touch with God loving me or helping me through an event that was difficult or whatever. Remember, my father actually passed away while I was doing the exercises. And it was after I finished them, and um, I can remember going to pick up my kids from school, and I had a CD on in the car, and it was a, a Christian singer. And whatever the song was, it touched me so deeply, and um, I started to cry. But part of the reason, it, I, there was like this connection with my father, who I was very close with. And he, and in that moment, I guess without too much, I look back at that and I can see God loving me, giving me something that brought me very close to this father, this man that I loved deeply, who I couldn't touch anymore, you know. And and this was not a song that we'd shared together. It wasn't like something that... Um, I go, oh, this reminds me of Dad because we used to sing this. No, 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 no. It was just, I forget I forget even what it was, but there was something that just opened a window. And and I, can, I, li- I look back at that and think, this was God loving me, you know, through the process. Oh, I could go on and on about that. I've, it, <laughs> but it's a wonderful, so that's in, in preparation days. We do that. And preparation days then culminate in the first movement of the exercises, which is called the Principle and Foundation. And in that Principle and Foundation, we're basically given uh, why we're here. You know, Ignatius was very clear about getting in touch with this loving God, this creator God, and then, okay, if, if I'm loved, how do I, what am I supposed to do? And the Principle and Foundation says, you know, you were, you were created for a purpose. And again, that's that uniqueness for us as individuals. We're all here for our own different calling, if you will. Mm -hmm. And he says, and then how do we live that out? To praise, reverence, and serve our God, and by so doing, to come to our God, to meet our God, to move closer to our God. The first week of the exercises is, again, about our brokenness, if you will. Okay, and that that can keep us so many times we think, I hear that God loves me, but how could God love me? 
how could God love me with all my faults and my things that I do that aren't loving, you know? And so we were called to sit down with those things. And I like to really look at it more than calling it just blatant sin because there's so many connotations about sin. What are the things in my life that block me from receiving the love that God is offering so generously? He's not looking at my worthiness. He just wants to love me. What is keeping me from receiving that? In the second week, so in and so the the grounding in that is uh, unconditional love. We start out with I am loved. First week, I am loved unconditionally. Then in second week, we start with this wonderful meditation that Ignatius supplies for us about the incarnation of Jesus. It, it's so beautiful. He asks us to look down with the Trinity on the world. And, and you see all the disorder and everything. And, and there's a beautiful painting on the ceiling at St. Francis where you see the Trinity. And you see Jesus holding the cross, but step he has his toe on the earth. And I always think that's such a beautiful image of this meditation on, on the Incarnation. It's like, Father, send me. So now we have love with us. We go on, and second week is a wonderful time because we really come to know Jesus. We give ourselves permission to go into those scriptures. Who was this man? What did he say? You know, who was he interacting with? How does this affect me? So it's, and and you see him choosing his disciples. So in a sense, it's the call to discipleship. Okay, this is not just something that happened 2,000 years ago. We're still being called. He's still calling us to be his disciples and to live this love out in the world. Third week, then, is about the passion. And I like to kind of frame that with the cost of love. It's a hard one. It's a hard one. The cost of love. And we look at Jesus. I always try to share with my directees that that the that passion was a was a love story it was, and it was the culmination of god bringing love to us that that jesus would would be born and live and live just like us live as human a human being in this world to show us the way that we can live more fully this love mission if you will so it, it, it is the cost of love. Sometimes it's not easy. Most times it's not easy. Sure. The fourth week, I, I like to look at that as, as twofold as well. We start with the resurrection. And I'm not, I, I, I want to call it the power of love. Power in the best sense of the word. This is what this love can do. Jesus didn't just die. He rose from the dead. And, he'll, and he tells his apostles, he tells us, I will be with you always. That's the power of love. The second component is what we call the contemplatio, the contemplation to learn to love as God loves. So it's kind of like becoming love. How do we take this process, this life, if you will, and, and live out this love that we are given so fully every day how do we do it and then finally that that is service how do we make it happen what are we being called to i was in a class one time and we were we were being asked to kind of revitalize the 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 mission if you will and like how can we uh do more in our communities and maybe in our faith uh our churches our families and as i prayed with that it was kind of interesting because what I heard very loud and clear was not necessarily to do more, to take more onto my plate, but to do what I was already doing with more love. Mm. And that speaks volumes to me, you know, because we can do many things and, and we do them well. But is there that component of love that reigns over it all, like the umbrella over it all? Well, it's a matter, too, of, of, like you say, it's it's an easy thought, right? God loves us. We receive that love. We give it to others. A simple thought, but not easy to do. 
Right. Because even if we're able to receive that love, a lot of times that love passes out of us, but it passes through all these filters of judgment. Absolutely. All these, all these, uh, with these worthiness check boxes that we assign to other people. Absolutely. And I, I think, too, the receiving of that love, we put up so many barriers. Again, we may not say it out loud, but there's that sense of, I'm not worthy. And, and I'm hearing over and over all the time, it's not about worthiness. But let's go back to freedom. Mm-hmm. When we can embrace the fact that we're loved and we're loved unconditionally, the freedom is about surrendering to that love. It's about, in some ways, it's about loving obedience to my God. Mm-hmm. And, and obedience, not something that's put on us to stifle us, but to move toward his way. His way of loving in the world, you know, and that that is a lifetime event. Oh yeah, it's a lifetime event. Well, I mean, if we the second we stop moving towards it, I I think I think we're dead at that point, right? Yeah, or quite stagnant. <laughs> quite stagnant, yeah. yeah. Which yeah. spiritually, uh... right? So when you're taking new people on and you're watching this transition occur in people, not not transition, this deepening of self. What does that feel like? Like you've been doing this for a while and you've seen this, 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 this motion in people. What's that like? Yeah. Well, it, it's very humbling. It's very humbling to have individuals that are so open to share their story with, with me. And then in sharing that and then companioning them, one component, I'm not sure this is totally what you were asking for, but to get in touch with their language, to really, everybody, we think we're all saying the same thing, but, you know, everybody has, if you will, a language. Certain words have a connotation that um, we may or may not embrace, but to be able to sit with an individual and be able to hear what they're saying, hear what they're sharing, what they're, um, maybe what they're struggling with, what, they're, what makes them happy, what makes them sad, what, is, um, what oppresses them, if you will, or, and what breaks them free. I can't explain what a, a humbling experience it is, is to sit with another individual and have them trust you so completely that they'll share their story with you. Because there are some moments of true vulnerability when you Absolutely. Go but that's where we're beautiful, remember? <laughs> no, and and a, a good director will help you help you feel that way. I know when I was being directed by Anne, who I'm pretty sure was one of the OGs. Yes, in yeah, this. one of our founding mothers. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, we were going through it together, and and much like you were talking about, I was in desolation on occasion, very hard on myself in a way that, of course, God says I love you, and I'm like, well, let me, I'm going to try to change your mind on that, and he's like, you can't. But but Anne was so gentle. She was mm-hmm. so gentle in, in, in kind of helping me move through these vulnerable periods of desolation and helping me to see that God still loved me. Yes. And I, I think uh, a component of sitting with the other is to provide that safe place and for the individual to realize they're safe here. If they need to cry, they can cry. If they need to be angry, they can be angry. God knows you're angry. Mm-hmm. You know, you can't hide it. <laughs> you know, And sometimes it's in that accepting it or or uh, validating it yeah I am angry that we can free ourselves from it sure and you know we put it off okay oh no I'm not angry but we when we can embrace it even the the not so pretty places sometimes they can free us to go further to go deeper go deeper and this this uh, ability this uh, this service that is done for the folks who take this well here it's rather unique like uh, it, like St. Francis Xavier, I'm not sure if there's anywhere else quite like us. Absolutely. I think one of the things that makes it, we, we are parish-based. Now, many of the programs across the country will use a, a church for their meetings and things like that, or maybe even their directions. But we are supported by St. Francis. And so if there's a cost of any, if we, if we put on a meal for the directees or whatever, the parish picks that up. Copying costs, um, different books maybe that um, are made available, and our directors. This this is a vocation. 
the directors are not paid, and they know that coming in. They know now, and that is not always the case in many of these um, retreat centers. Hmm. They they will get a stipend for what they're doing, which is fine. I'm not finding fault with that, and whatever. But from the very beginning, Father um, Kevin Clark was the pastor here when we started, and he was adamant that this was not going to cost the individuals anything to do it, that they could come and get closer to their God. And the thing is, those of us who have discerned to be directors, it's a gift to us. It's not about getting a stipend or anything. It's, it's about being part of the community and being part of the ministry and, and being blessed to do it. I remember the very first year, I, did, I was the second year of the exercise. I remember one of the early directors, uh, when we were starting that year, she, she was going on and on about how blessed she felt. You know, and, and I'm thinking, this is a lot of work for you. you know, how, what do you mean? I know now. I knew right after I started directing of what a gift it is to sit with another individual, to be a vehicle for the Holy Spirit, to, to touch this individual is, is more than a gift. It, it's more than, it's, it's hard to explain. It's hard to put into words and to be trusted by another human that you will sit with them, you will companion them through the light and the dark and the joy and the sorrow and, and be there. I always think, you know, I was talking about faithfulness to the process and how important it is to be faithful uh, as a directee, as a retreatant, to the process of walking through this. It's equally as important for the directors to be faithful to the process, mm -hmm. to be faithful to those people that are coming to you, even if it's just for you to sit with them and give them a safe place to to tell their story, to embrace their story, to go deeper into their story. And... Yeah, it, it is such a gift for the person receiving it, for sure. When I, I, to use an analogy, it was as though I was a seed in dry ground who suddenly tasted rain. Yeah. It, it, it didn't change me. I was still the seed, but I, but I was able to blossom more in my faith. Because yes. um, for me, a, a slight aside, I had a hard time connecting with Christ for the longest time. I'm a Christian, mm -hmm. and you know, I, I, I pray to him constantly, but in terms of connection, he seemed the furthest from me, which is weird because you like God, you know, the overall omniscient creator, Holy Spirit, the invisible force that shapes us. You'd think that those would be more foreign concepts, but the idea of a man who is perfect, <laughs> the yes. idea of somebody without sin, wow, that was just out there for me. But like you said, being able to, to be in the scriptures, to walk with his parents mm -hmm. when they were refugees, to witness his birth, to watch him growing up as, as, as a human, as human as you or I in that way, right. but still fully God. It, yeah. uh, it was a connection. It was a connection I'd never had before. Yes. Yes. It, it, that is developing that open relationship with our Savior. It, it's hard to explain. It's hard to explain. I think initially we, we put Jesus off there like, oh, you're man but you're God. And we forget that, no, yes, he, he is the second person in the Blessed Trinity, but uh, within that, he is also 100% human. Mm -hmm. He cried. He bled. He, he bled. He, I love in so many of the scripture readings throughout, he eats. You know, one of the things after the resurrection was, do you have some bread or let me make some fish on the side of the lake, you know, when they're out there fishing and he, he makes breakfast for them. Mm -hmm. He, he needed to eat. There was one, um, a, a reading, uh, recently, I think we had it at church with the, the gentleman who comes to ask for Jesus to come and heal his daughter. She's dying and he goes and they're all saying, well, she's dead already and all this. And he says, she's sleeping. And when she gets up, the first thing he says is give her something to eat. Right. You know, so he was so human. I bad. think we we tend to. I don't. I'm not sure. I don't. I'm, I don't know if we forget it. I'm not sure we've ever embraced it. That he was truly, truly human, and that's why he could come and show us the way. That's why he could say, "Okay, love your neighbor, mm -hmm. love your enemy." You 
you know, live that out. And he showed us how. And then and he showed us how. through the exercises, we're able to, to hear him a little bit better. Yes, because it's that invitation to be more open. Mm-hmm. I said early on that sometimes it's intimidating to think about this process. But I can remember a few, maybe a month or the second month, I was running to that hour a day because there was always something to um, experience. And, and Ignatius is very good at asking us to repeat things. Mm -hmm. Like, we'll be given a scripture, and then the next day we're supposed to pray with it again. Not that we didn't get it the first time. Again, it's that opportunity to go deeper. Okay, this is what you got yesterday. Let me tell you this today. Right. You know, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's quite a process. It, and it's so inviting. I like to think of the exercises like really inviting us into a deeper relationship with our God. The hospitality of that. Mm-hmm. Of, and then we're invited to embrace it. You know, again, that idea of the freedom to let our God love us. Well, and is there any finishing thoughts for us today? Oh, golly. I, I, I probably could go on and on and on. Thank and we're going to have you listening. back on, by the way. <laughs> I want to have you back on. <laughs> um, I'm so honored. Um, first of all, again, I, 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 I just am so honored to be part of this ministry and, to, uh, and humbled by it. it. It's a wonderful humbling. And to think of our history, the history of, of the people who have come, the people who have taken this on their way. It, it, change, it doesn't change you. It opens those areas up that we protect very well. So it feels maybe like we're changed, but no, 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 no. God invites us to become our most authentic selves. And Ignatius found a way to help us do that. Mm, I love Amen. it. Amen. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Marianne. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you so much. Thank you for being with us today as we walk as pilgrims this road together. If you feel called to learn more, please consider checking out St. Francis Xavier or your local Catholic church. All are welcome into our community as God loves us all equally. If you are interested in supporting the Vox SFX podcast, please visit sfxmissoula.org backslash donate. Until next time, go forth in peace and be the light of Christ in someone's day.